Chapter 14 of Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Casey E. Kennard. Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe by Thornton Hall. Chapter 14 An Empress and Her Favorites. Catherine II of Russia. When Sophie Augusta Frederica of Anhalt Zerbst was romping on the ramparts or in the streets of Stettin with Berger's children for playmates, he would have been a bold prophet who would have predicted that one day she would be the most splendid figure among Europe's sovereigns, the only great man in Europe, according to Voltaire, an angel before whom all men should be silent, and that while dazzling Europe by her statesmanship and learning, she would afford more material for scandal than any woman, except perhaps Christina of Sweden, who ever wore a crown. There is much, it is true, to be said in extenuation of the weakness that has left such a stain on the memory of Catherine II of Russia. Equipped far beyond most women with the beauty and charms that fascinate men, and craving more than most of her sex the love of man, she was mated when little more than a child to the most degenerate prince in all Europe. The Grand Duke Peter, heir to the Russian throne, who at sixteen took to wife the girl princess of Anhalt Zerbst, was already an expert in almost every vice. Imbecile in mind, he found his chief pleasure in the company of the most degraded. He rarely went to bed sober. In fact, his bride's first sight of him was when he was drunk, at the age of ten. He was, too, a liar and a coward, vicious and violent, pale, sickly, and uncomely, a crooked soul in a prematurely ravaged body. Such was the Grand Duke Peter to whom the high-spirited, beautiful Princess Sophie, thenceforth to be known as Catherine, was tied for life one day in the year 1744 a youth the very sight of whom repelled her, while his vices filled her with loathing. Add to this revolting union the fact that she found herself under the despotic rule of the Empress Elizabeth, who made no concealment of her hatred and jealousy of the fair young princess, surrounded her with spies and treated her as a rebellious child, to be checked and bullied at every turn, and it is not difficult to understand the spirit of recklessness and defiance that was soon roused in Catherine's breast. There was at the Russian court no lack of temptation to indulge this spirit of revolt to the fool. The young German beauty, mated to worse than a clown, soon had her court of admirers to pour flatteries into her dainty ears, and she would perhaps have been less than a woman if she had not eagerly drunk them in. She had no need of anyone to tell her that she was fair. "'I know I am beautiful as the day,' she once exclaimed, as she looked at her mirrored reflection in her first ball finery at St. Petersburg, with a red rose in her glorious hair. And the mirror told no flattering tale. See the picture Poniatowski, one of her earliest and most ardent slaves, paints of the young Grand Duchess. With her black hair she has a dazzling whiteness of skin, a vivid color, large blue eyes prominent and eloquent, black and long eyebrows, a Greek nose, a mouth that looked made for kissing, a slight, rather tall figure, a carriage that was lively yet full of nobility, a pleasing voice and a laugh as merry as the humor through which she could pass with ease from the most playful and childish amusements to the most fatiguing mathematical calculations. With the brain, even in those early years, of a clever man, she was essentially a woman with all a woman's passion for the admiration and love of men. And one cannot wonder, however much one may deplore, that while her imbecile husband was guzzling with common soldiers, or playing with his toys and tin cannon in bed, vacuous smiles on his face, his beautiful bride should find her own pleasures in the homage of a Soltikoff, a Poniatowski, an Orloff, or any other of the legion of lovers who in quick succession took her fancy. 
The first among her admirers to capture her fancy was Sergius Soltikoff, her chamberlain, high-born, beautiful as the day, polished courtier, supple-tongued wooer, to whom the Grand Duchess gave the heart her husband spurned. But Soltikoff's reign was short. The fickle princess, ever seeking fresh conquests, wearied of him as of all her lovers in turn, and his place was taken within a year by Stanislas Poniatowski, a fascinating young Pole, who returned to St. Petersburg with the reputation of gallantry won in almost every court of Europe. Poniatowski had not perhaps the physical perfections of his dethroned predecessor, but he had the well-stored brain that made an even more potent appeal to Catherine. He could talk like an angel on every subject that appealed to her, from art to philosophy, and he had, moreover, a magnetic charm of manner which few women could resist. Such a lover was indeed after her heart, for he brought romance and adventure to his wooing, and whether he found his way to her boudoir disguised as a lady's tailor, or as one of the Grand Duke's musicians, or made open love to her under the very nose of her courtiers, he played his role of lover to admiration. Once Peter, in jealous mood, threatened to run his rival through with his sword, and in his rage went into his wife's bedroom and pulled her out of bed without leaving her time to dress. An hour later his anger had changed to an amused complacence, and he was supping with the culprits, and with boisterous laughter was drinking their healths. When at last a political storm drove Poniatowski from Russia, Catherine, who never forgot a banished lover, secured for him the crown of Poland. Thus the favorites come and go, each supreme for a time, each inevitably packed off to give place to a successor. With Poniatowski away in Poland, Catherine cast her eyes round her court to find a third favorite, and her choice was soon made. For of all her army of admirers, there was one who fully satisfied her ideal of handsome manhood. Of the five Orloff brothers, each a Goliath in stature and a Hercules in strength, the handsomest was Gregory, the giant with the face of an angel. Towering head and shoulders over most of his fellow courtiers, with knotted muscles which could fell an ox or crush a horseshoe with the closing of a hand, Gregory Orloff was reputed the bravest man in Russia, as he was the idol of his soldiers. He was also a notorious gambler and drinker, and the hero of countless love adventures. No greater contrast could be possible than between this daredevil son of Anak and the cultured, almost feminine Poniatowski. But Catherine loved, above all things, variety, and here it was in startling abundance. Nor was her new lover any the less desirable because he was some years younger than herself, or that his grandfather had been a common soldier in the army of Peter the Great. And Gregory Orloff proved himself as bold in wooing as he was brave in war. For him there was no stealing up back stairs, no masquerading in disguises. He was the elect favorite of the future Empress of Russia, and all the world should know it. He was inseparable from his mistress, and paid his court to her under the eyes of her husband, while Catherine, thus emboldened, made as little concealment of her partiality. But troublous days were coming to break the idol of their love. The Empress Elizabeth, as was inevitable, at last drank herself to death, and her nephew Peter, now a besotted imbecile of thirty-four, put on the imperial robes, and was free to indulge his madness without restraint. The first use he made of his freedom was to subject his wife to every insult and humiliation his debased brain could suggest. He flaunted his amours and vices before her, taunted her in public with her own indiscretions, and shouted in his cups that he would divorce her. Not content with these outrages on his empress, he lost no opportunity of disgusting his subjects and driving his soldiers to the verge of mutiny. Such an intolerable state of things could only have one issue. 
The emperor was undoubtedly mad. The emperor must go. Over the coup d'etat which followed we must pass hurriedly. The conspiracy of Catherine and the Orloffs, the eager response of the army which flocked to the empress, kissing me, embracing my hands, my feet, my dress, and calling me their savior. The marching of the insurgent troops to Oranienbaum, with Catherine astride on horseback at their head, and Peter's craven submission when he crawled on his knees to his wife, with whimpering and tears, begging her to allow him to keep his mistress, his dog, his negro, and his violin. The emperor was safe behind barred doors at Mopsa. Catherine was now empress in fact as well as name. Three weeks later Peter was dead. Was he done to death by Catherine's orders? To this day none can say with certainty. The story of this tragedy is told by Castera makes gruesome reading. One day Alexis Orloff and Teploff appeared at Mopsa to announce to the deposed sovereign his approaching deliverance, and to ask a dinner of him. Glasses and brandy were ordered, and while Teploff was amusing the Tsar, Orloff filled the glasses, adding poison to one of them. The Tsar, suspecting no harm, took the poison and swallowed it. He was soon seized with agonizing pains. He screamed aloud for milk, but the two monsters again presented poison to him and forced him to take it. When the Tsar's valet bravely interposed, he was hurled from the room. In the midst of the tumult there entered Prince Baratinsky, who commanded the guard. Orloff, who had already thrown down the Tsar, pressed upon his chest with his own knees, holding him fast at the same time by the throat. Baratinsky and Teploff then passed a table napkin with the sliding knot round his neck, and the murderers accomplished the work of death by strangling him. Such is the story as it has come down to us, and as it was believed in Russia at the time. That Gregory Orloff was innocent of a crime in which his own brother played a leading part is as little to be credited as that Catherine herself was in ignorance of the design on her husband's life. But however this may be, we are told that when the news of her husband's death was brought to the Empress at a banquet, she was to all appearance overcome with horror and grief. She left the table with streaming eyes and spent the next few days in unapproachable solitude in her rooms. Thus at last Catherine was free both from the tyranny of Elizabeth and from the brutality of her bestial husband. She was sole sovereign of all the Russias, at liberty to indulge any caprice that entered her versatile brain. That her subjects, almost to a man, regarded her with horror as her husband's murderer, that this detestation was shared by the army that had put her on the throne, and by the nobles who had been her slaves, troubled her little. She was mistress of her fate, and strong enough, as indeed she proved, to hold with a firm grasp the scepter she had won. High as Gregory Orloff had stood in her favor before she came to her crown, his position was now more splendid and secure. She showered her favors on him with prodigal hand. Lands and jewels and gold were squandered on her first favorite, the official designation she invented for him, and he wore on his broad chest her miniature in a blazing oval of diamonds, the crowning mark of her approval and to his brothers she was almost equally generous, for in a few years of her ascendancy the Orloffs were enriched by vast estates on which forty-five thousand serfs toiled, by palaces, and by gold to the amount of seventeen million roubles. Such it was to be in the good books of Catherine II, Empress of Russia. With riches and power Gregory's ambition grew until he dreamt of sitting on the throne itself by Catherine's side, and in her foolish infatuation even this prize might have been his, had not wiser counsels come to her rescue. The Empress, said Panin to her, can do what she likes, but Madame Orloff can never be Empress of Russia. And thus Gregory's greatest ambition was happily nipped in the bud. 
the man who had played his cards with such skill and discretion in the early days of his love-making had now his head swollen by pride and power grown reckless if he could not be emperor in name he would at least wield the sceptre the woman to whom he owed all was he thought a puppet in his hands as ready to do his bidding as any of his minions but through all her dallying Catherine's smiles masked an iron will in heart she was a woman in brain and will-power a man and orloff like many another favorite was to learn the lesson to his cost the time came when she could no longer tolerate his airs and assumptions there was only one empress but lovers were plentiful and she already had an eye on his successor and thus it was that one day the swollen orloff was sent on a diplomatic mission to arrange peace between russia and turkey when she bade him good-bye she called him her angel of peace but she knew that it was her angel's farewell to his paradise how the ambassador instead of making peace stirred up the embers of war into fresh flame is a matter of history but he was not long left to work such mad mischief while he was swaggering at a yashi fate in a costume ablaze with diamonds worth a million roubles news came to him of a good-looking young lieutenant who was not only installed in his place by catherine's side but was actually occupying his own apartments within an hour he was racing back to st petersburg resting neither night nor day till he had covered the thousand leagues that separated him from the capital before however his sweating horses could enter it he was stopped by catherine's emissaries and ordered to repair to the imperial palace at gatshina and then he realized that his son had indeed come to its setting his honors were soon stripped from him and although he was allowed to keep his lands his gold and jewels the spoils of cupid the diamond framed miniature was taken away to adorn the breast of his successor the lieutenant under this cloud of disfavor orloff conducted himself with such resignation none knew better than he how futile it was to fight that catherine before many months had passed not only recalled him to court but secured for him a princedom of the holy empire as for prince gregory she said amiably he is free to go or stay to hunt to drink or to gamble i intend to live according to my own pleasure and in entire independence after a tragically brief wedded life with the beautiful girl cousin who died of consumption orloff returned to st petersburg to spend the last few months of his life broken-hearted and mad and to his last hour his clouded brain was tortured with visions of the avenging shade of the murdered peter end of chapter 14 recording by casey e canard chapter 15 of love affairs of the courts of europe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by t j burns love affairs of the courts of europe by thornton hall a seventeenth century cinderella it was to all seeming a strange whim that caused cardinal mazarin one day in the year sixteen fifty three to summon his nieces daughters of his sister hieronim mancini from their obscurity in italy to bask in the sunshine of his splendors in paris at the time of this odd caprice rachel yu's crafty successor had reached the zenith of his power he was the most potent and splendid figure in all europe that did not wear a crown he was the avowed favorite and lover of anne of austria queen of france to whose vanity he had paid such skilful court indeed it was common rumor that she had actually given him her hand in secret marriage the boy king louis the fourteenth was a puppet in his strong hands he was in fact 
the dictator of france whose smiles the greatest courtiers tried to win and before whose frowns they trembled in contrast to such magnificence his sister madame mancini was the wife of a petty italian baron who was struggling to bring up her five daughters on a pathetically scanty purse as far removed from her magnificent brother as a moth from a star there was on the face of things every reason why the great and all-powerful cardinal should leave his nieces to their genteel poverty and we can imagine both the astonishment and delight with which madame mancini received the summons to paris which meant such a revolution in life for her and her daughters if the mancini girls had no heritage of money they had at least the dower of beauty each of the five gave promise of a rare loveliness with the solitary exception of marie madame's third daughter who at fourteen was singularly unattractive even for that awkward age tall thin and angular without a vestige of grace either of figure or movement she had a sallow face out of which two great black eyes looked gloomily and a mouth wide and thin-lipped she was in addition shy and slow-witted to the verge of stupidity marie in fact was quite hopeless the ugly duckling of a good-looking family and for this reason an object of dislike and resentment to her mother certainly said madame marie must be left behind her other daughters would be a source of pride to their uncle he could secure great matches for them but marie Ha! she would bring discredit on the whole family and so it was decided in conclave that the ugly duckling should be left in a nunnery the only fit place for her but marie happily had a spirit of her own she would not be left behind she declared and if she must go to a nunnery why there were nunneries in plenty in france to which they could send her and marie had her way she was not however to escape the cloister after all for to a paris nunnery she was consigned when her cardinal uncle had set eyes on her let her have a year or two there was his verdict and who knows she may blossom into a beauty yet at any rate she can put on flesh and not be the scarecrow she is and thus while her more favored sisters were reveling in the gaieties of court life marie was sent to tell her beads and to spend spartan days among the nuns nearly two years passed before mazarin expressed a wish to see his ugly niece again and it was indeed a very different marie who now made her curtsy to him gone were the angular figure the awkward movements the sallow face the slow wits time and the healthy life of the cloisters had done their work well what the cardinal now saw was a girl of seventeen of exquisitely modelled figure graceful and self-possessed a face piquant and full of animation illuminated by a pair of glorious dark eyes and with a dazzling smile which revealed the prettiest teeth in france above all what delighted the cardinal most she had now a sprightly wit and a quite brilliant gift of conversation it was thus a smiling and gratified cardinal who gave greeting to his niece now as fair as her sisters and more fascinating than any of them there was no doubt that he could find a high-placed husband for her and thus for this was in fact his motive for rescuing his pretty nieces from their obscurity make his position secure by powerful family alliances it was not long before mazarin fixed on a suitor in the person of armand de la porte 
son of the Marquis de la Meilleraie, one of the most powerful nobles in France. But alas for his scheming! Armand's heart had already been caught while Marie was reciting her matins and vespers. He had lost it utterly to her beautiful sister, Hortense. He vowed that he would marry no other, and that if Hortense could not be his wife, he would prefer to die. Thus, Marie was rescued from a union which brought her sister so much misery in later years, and for a time she was condemned to spend unhappy months with her mother at the Louvre. To this period of her life, Marie Mancini could never look back without a shudder. My mother, she says, who I think had always hated me, was more unbearable than ever. She treated me, although I was no longer ugly, with the utmost aversion and cruelty. My sisters went to court and were fussed and fated. I was kept always at home in our miserable lodgings an unhappy cinderella but fortune did not long hide his face from cinderella her prince charming was coming in the guise of the handsome young king louis the fourteenth himself it was one day while visiting madame mancini in her lodgings at the louvre that louis first saw the girl who was to play such havoc with his heart and at the first sight of those melting dark eyes and that intoxicating smile, he was undone. He came again and again, always under the pretext of visiting Madame, and happy beyond expression if he could exchange a few words with her daughter, Marie, until he soon counted a day worse than lost that did not bring him the stolen sweetness of a meeting when a few weeks later madame mancini died and marie was recalled to court by her uncle her life was completely changed for her louis had now abundant opportunities of seeking her side and excellent use he made of them the two young people were inseparable much to the alarm of the cardinal and madame Meret, the queen the young king was never happy out of her sight he danced with her, and none could dance more divinely than Marie. He listened as she sang to him with a voice whose sweetness thrilled him. They read the same books together in blissful solitude. She taught him her native Italian and entranced him by the brilliance of her wit. And when, after a slight illness, he heard of her anxious inquiries and her tears of sympathy, his conquest was complete. He vowed that she and no other should be his wife and queen of France. But these halcyon days were not to last long. It was no part of Mazarin's scheming that a niece of his should sit on the throne. The prospect was dazzling, it is true, but it would inevitably mean his own downfall. So strongly would such an alliance be resented by friends as well as enemies and Anne of Austria was as little in the mood to be deposed by such an obscure person as the Mancini girl. Thus it was that Queen and Cardinal joined hands to nip the young romance in the bud. A royal bride must be found for Louis, and that quickly, and negotiations were soon on foot to secure as his wife Margaret, Princess of Savoy, in vain did the boy king storm and protest. Equally futile were Marie's tearful pleadings to her uncle. The fiat had gone forth. Louis must have a royal bride, and she was already about to leave Italy on her bridal progress to France. It was, we may be sure, with a heavy heart that Marie joined the cavalcade, which, with its gorgeous procession of equipages, its gaily mounted courtiers, and its brave escort of soldiery, swept out of Paris on its stately progress to Lyon to meet the queen-to-be. But there was no escape from the humiliation 
for she must accompany Anne of Austria as one of her retinue of maids of honor. Arrived too soon at Lyon, Louis rides on to give first greeting to his bride, who is now within a day's journey, and returns with a smiling face to announce to his mother that he finds the princess pleasing to his eye, and to describe with boyish enthusiasm her grace and graciousness, her magnificent eyes, her beautiful hair, and the delicate olive of her complexion, while Marie's heart sinks at the recital could this be the lover who but a few days ago had been at her feet vowing that she was the only bride in all the world for him when he seeks her side and shamefacedly makes excuses for his seeming recreancy she bids him marry his ugly bride in accents of scorn and then bursts into tears which she only consents to wipe away when he declares that his heart will always be hers, and that he will never marry the Italian princess. But Margaret of Savoy was not, after all, to be Queen of France. She was, as it proved, merely a pawn in the cardinal's deep game. It was a Spanish alliance that he sought for his young king, and when, at the eleventh hour, an ambassador came hurriedly to Lyon to offer the Infanta's hand, the Savoy Duke and his sister, the Princess, had perforce to return to Italy empty-handed. There was at least a time of respite now for Louis and Marie, and as they rode back to Paris side by side, chatting gaily and exchanging sweet confidences, the sun once more shone on the happiest young people in all France then followed a period of blissful days of dances and fates in brilliant succession in which the lovers were inseparable above all of long rambles together when the world forgetting they could live in the happy present whatever the future might have in store for them meanwhile the negotiations for the spanish marriage were ripening fast louis and marie again appeal first to the cardinal then to the queen to sanction their union but to no purpose both are inflexible their foolish romance must come to an end as a last resort marie flies to the king with tender pleadings and tears begging him not to desert her to which he answers that no power on earth shall make him wed the infanta you alone he swears shall wear the crown of queen and in token of his love he buys for her the pearls that were the most treasured belongings of the exiled stuart queen henrietta maria the lovers part in tears and the following day marie receives orders to leave paris and to retire to la rochelle at every stage of her journey she was overtaken by messengers bearing letters from louis full of love and protestations of unflinching loyalty and when louis moved with his court to bayonne the lovers met once more to mingle their tears but louis ever fickle was already wavering again if i must marry the infanta he said i suppose i must but i shall never love any but you marie now realized that this was to be the end in face of a lover so weak and a fate so inflexible what could she do but submit and it was with a proud but breaking heart that she wrote a few days later to tell louis that she wished him not to write her again and that she would not answer his letters one june day news came to her that her lover was married and that he was very much in love with the infanta and even her pride crushed as it was could not restrain her from writing to her sister hortense say everything you can that is horrid about him point out all his faults to me 
that I may find relief for my aching heart. When a few months later Marie saw the king again, he received her almost as a stranger, and had the bad taste to sing the praises of his queen. But Marie Mancini was the last girl in all France to wed herself long to grief or an outraged vanity. There were other lovers by the score among whom she could pick and choose. She was more lovely now than when the recreant Louis first succumbed to her charms. With a ripened witchery of black eyes, red lips, the flash of pearly teeth revealed by every dazzling smile, with glorious black hair, the grace of a fawn, and a voluptuous fascination which no man could resist. Prince Charles of Lorraine was her veriest slave, but Mazarin would have none of him. Prince Colonna, Grand Constable of Naples, was more fortunate when he in turn came a-wooing. He bore the proudest name in Italy, and he had wealth, good looks, and high connections to lend a glamour to his birth. The cardinal smiled on his suit, and Marie, since she had no heart to give, willingly gave her hand. Louis himself graced the wedding with his presence, and we are told, as the white-faced bride said the yes, which was to bind her to a stranger, her eyes, with an indescribable expression, sought those of the king who turned pale as he met them. Over the rest of Marie Mancini's checkered life, we must hasten. After a few years of wedded life with her Italian prince, Colonna's early passion for his beautiful wife was succeeded by a distaste amounting to hatred. He disgusted her with amours, and when she ventured to protest against his infidelity, he tried to poison her. This crowning outrage determined Marie to fly, and in company with her sister, Hortense, who had fled to her from the brutality of her own husband, she made her escape one dark night to Savita Vecchia, where a boat was awaiting the runaways. Hotly pursued on land and sea, narrowly escaping shipwreck, braving hardships, hunger, and hourly danger of capture, the fugitives at last reached Marseilles, where Marie, Hortense now seeking a refuge in Savoy, began those years of wandering and adventure, the story of which outstrips fiction. Now we find her seeking asylum at convents from Aix to Madrid, now queening it at the court of Savoy with Duke Charles Emmanuel for lover. Now she is dazzling Madrid with the Almirante of Castilla, and many another high-placed worshipper dancing attendance on her. And now she is in Rome, turning the heads of grave cardinals with her witcheries. Sometimes penniless and friendless, at others lapped in luxury, but carrying everywhere in her bosom the English pearls, the last gift of her false and frail Louis. Thus, through the long, troubled years, until old age crept on her, the cardinal's niece wandered, a fugitive, over the face of Europe, alternately caressed and buffeted by fortune, until, at long last, the end came and brought peace with it. As she lay dying in the house of a good Samaritan at Pisa, with no other hand to minister to her, she called for pen and paper, and with failing hand wrote her own epitaph, surely the most tragic ever penned. Marie Mancini Colonna, Dust and Ashes End of chapter 15 Read by T.J. Burns Chapter 16 of Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe. This is a LibriVox recording. 
all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b love affairs of the courts of europe by thornton hall chapter sixteen bianca grand duchess of tuscany more than three centuries have gone since florence made merry over the death of her grand duchess bianca it was an occasion for rejoicing her name was bandied from lips to lips la pessima bianca jeers and laughter followed her to her unmarked grave in the church of san lorenzo but through the ages her picture has come down to us as she strutted on the world's stage in all her pride and beauty with a vividness which few better women of her time retain it was in the year fifteen forty eight when our boy king the sixth edward was fresh to his crown that bianca capello was cradled in the palace of her father one of the greatest men of venice senator and privy councillor as a child she was as beautiful as she was wilful the pride of her father the despair of his wife her stepmother her little head full of romance her heart full of rebellion against any kind of discipline or restraint before she had left the schoolroom capello's daughter was by common consent the fairest girl in her native city with a beauty riper than her years tall and with a well-developed figure of singular grace she carried her head as proudly as any queen her fair hair fell in a rippling cascade far below her waist her face hands and throat we are told were white as lilies save for the delicate rose colour that tinted her cheeks her eyes were large and dark and of an almost dazzling brilliance and her full pouting lips were red and fragrant as a rose such was bianca capello on the threshold of womanhood as you may see her pictured to-day in bronzino's miniature at the british museum with a loveliness which set the hearts of the venetian gallants aflutter before our shakespeare was in his cradle she might if she would have mated with almost any noble in tuscany had not her foolish wayward fancy fallen on pietro bonaventuri a handsome young clerk in salviati's bank whose eyes had often strayed from his ledgers to follow her as in the company of her maid the senator's daughter took her daily walk past his office window at sight of so fair a vision pietro was undone he fell violently in love with her long before he exchanged a word with her and although no one knew better than he the gulf that separated the daughter of a nobleman and a senator from the drudge of the quill he determined to win her youth and good looks such as his with plenty of assurance to support them had done as much for others and they should do it for him how they first met we know not but we know that shortly after this momentous meeting bianca had completely lost her heart to the knight of the quill with the handsome face the dark flashing eyes and the courtly manner other meetings followed secret rendezvous arranged by the duenna herself in return for liberal bribes to keep which bianca would steal out of her father's palace at dead of night leaving the door open behind her to ensure safe return before dawn on one such occasion so the story runs bianca returned to find the door closed against her by a too officious hand she dared not wake the sleepers to gain admittance that would be to expose her secret and to cover herself with disgrace and in her fears and alarm she fled back to her lover however this may be we know that for some urgent reason or other the young lovers disappeared one night together from venice and made their way to florence to find a refuge under the roof of pietro's parents here a terrible disillusion met bianca at the threshold her husband for on the runaway journey pietro had secured the friendly services of a village priest to marry them had told her that he was the son of noble parents kin to his employers the salviatis the home to which he now introduced her was little better than a hovel with poverty looking out of its windows here indeed was a sorry homecoming for the new-made bride daughter of the great capello there was not even a drudge to do the housework which bianca was compelled to share 
with her bucolic mother-in-law it is even said that she was compelled to do laundry work in order to keep the domestic purse supplied her husband had forfeited his meagre salary she had equally sacrificed the fortune left to her by her mother sordid grinding poverty stared both in the face to return to her own home in venice was impossible so furious were her father and stepmother at her escapade that a large reward was advertised for the capture of her husband alive or dead and a sentence of death had been procured from the council of ten in the event of his arrest more than this a sentence of banishment was pronounced against pietro and bianca the maid who had contrived at their illicit wooing and flight paid for her treachery with her life and pietro's uncle ended his days in a loathsome dungeon such was the vengeance taken by bartolomeo capello as for the runaways they spent a long honeymoon in concealment an hourly dread of the fate that hung over them it was well known however in florence where they were in hiding and curious crowds were drawn to the bonaventuri hovel to catch a glimpse of the heroes of a scandal with which all italy was ringing thus it was that francesco de medici first set eyes on the woman who was to play so great a part in his life there could be no greater contrast than that between francesco de medici heir to the tuscan grand dukedom and the beautiful young wife of the bank clerk now playing the role of maid of all work and charwoman it is said that francesco was a madman and indeed what we know of him makes this description quite plausible he was a man of black brow and violent temper repelling alike in appearance and manner he was we are told more of a savage than a civilized human being his food was deluged with ginger and pepper his favorite fare was raw eggs filled with red pepper and raw onions of which he ate enormous quantities he drank iced water by the gallon and slept between frozen sheets he was a man moreover of evil life familiar with every form of vicious indulgence his only redeeming feature was a love of art which enriched the galleries of florence such was the medici half ogre half madman who riding one day through a florence slum saw at the window of a mean dwelling the beautiful face of bianca bonaventuri and rode on leaving his heart behind here indeed was a dainty dish to set before his jaded appetite the owner of that fair face with the crimson lips and the black flashing eyes must be his on the following day a great court lady the marchesa mondragon presents herself at the bonaventuri door with smiles and gracious words bearing an invitation to court for the lady of the window impossible bluntly answers signora bonaventuri her daughter-in-law has no clothes fit to be seen at court but persists the marchesa that is a matter that can be easily arranged it will be a pleasure to me to supply the necessary outfit if the signora and her daughter-in-law will but come to-morrow to the mondragon palace the bride when consulted is not unwilling and the following day in company with her mother-in-law she is effusively received by the marchesa and is feasting her eyes on exquisite robes and the glitter of rare gems among which she is invited to make her choice a moment later francesco enters and with courtly grace is kissing the hand of his new divinity then followed secret meetings such as marked bianca's first unhappy wooing in venice hours of rapture for the tuscan duke of flattered submission by the runaway bride and within a few weeks we find bianca installed in a palace of her own with francesco's guards and equipage ever at its door while his newly made bride giovanna archduchess of austria kept her lonely vigil in the apartments which so seldom saw her husband francesco indeed had no eyes or thought for any but the lovely woman who had so completely enslaved him as for her condemn her as we must much can be pleaded in extenuation of her conduct she had been basely deceived and betrayed on the one side was a life of sordid poverty and drudgery with a husband for whom she had now nothing but dislike and contempt on the other was the ardent homage of the future ruler of tuscany with its accompaniment of splendor luxury and power 
a fig for love ambition should now rule her life she would drain the cup of pleasure though the dregs might be bitter to the taste she was now in the very prime of her beauty and a queen in all but the name between her and her full queendom were but two obstacles her lover's plain unattractive wife and her own worthless husband and of these obstacles one was soon to be removed from her path pietro who had been made chamberlain to the tuscan court was more than content that his wife should go her own way so long as he was allowed to go his he was kept very agreeably occupied with love affairs of his own the richest widow in florence cassandra borghiani was eager to lavish her smiles and favours on him and the knowledge that two of his predecessors in her affection had fallen under the assassin's knife only lent zest to a love adventure which was after his heart warnings of the fate that might await him in turn fell on deaf ears when his wife ventured to point out the danger he retorted if you say another word i will cut your throat the following night as he was returning from a visit to the widow a dagger was sheathed in his heart and pietro's amorous race was run such was the end of the bank clerk and his eleventh hour glories and love adventures now only giovanna remained to block the way to the pinnacle of bianca's ambition and her health was so frail that the waiting might not be long giovanna had provided no successor to her husband who had now succeeded to his grand dukedom if bianca could succeed where the grand duchess had failed she could at least ensure that a son of hers would one day rule over tuscany thus one august day in fifteen seventy six the news flashed round florence that a male child had been born in the palace on the via maggiore francesco was in the seventh heaven of delight here at last was the long looked for inheritor of his honours the son who was to perpetuate the glories of the medici and to thwart his brother the cardinal who had so confidently counted on the succession for himself and madame bianca professed herself equally delighted although her pleasure was qualified by fear she had played her part with consummate cleverness but there were two women who knew the true story of the birth of the child which had been smuggled into the palace from a florence slum one was the changeling's mother a woman of the people whom a substantial bribe had induced to part with her newborn infant the other was bianca's waiting woman these witnesses to the imposture must be silenced effectually hired assassins made short work of the mother the waiting maid was left for dead in a mountain pass to which she had been lured but she survived long enough at least to communicate her secret to the grand duke's brother the cardinal ferdinand de medici bianca was now in a parlous plight at any moment her enemy the cardinal might betray her to her lover and bring the carefully planned edifice of her fortunes tumbling about her ears but she proved equal even to this emergency taking her courage in both hands she herself confessed the fraud to the grand duke who not only forgave her so completely was he under the spell of her beauty but insisted on calling the gutter child his son the tables however were soon to be turned on her for giovanna who had long despaired of providing an heir to her husband gave birth a few months later to a male child florence was jubilant for the grand duchess was as beloved as her rival was detested and the christening of the heir was made the occasion of festivities and rejoicing bianca's day of triumph seemed at last to be over for a time she left florence to hide her humiliation but within a year she was back again to be received with open arms of welcome by the duke during her absence she had made peace with her family and when her father and brother came to florence to visit her they were received by francesco with regal entertainments and sent away loaded with presents and honors bianca had now reached the zenith of her power and splendor before she had been back many months the grand duchess died to the undisguised relief of her husband who hastened from her funeral to the arms of her rival her position was now secure unassailable and before giovanna had been two months in the family vault bianca was secretly married to her grand ducal lover florence was furious but what mattered that the venetian senate had recognized bianca as a true daughter of the republic 
she was the legal wife of the ruler of tuscany she was grand duchess at last and she meant all the world to know it that she was cordially hated by her husband's subjects that the air was full of stories of her extravagance her intemperance and her cruelty gave her no moment's unhappiness for eight years she reigned as queen wielding the sceptre her husband's hands were too weak or indifferent to hold giovanna's son had followed his mother to the grave and the child of the slums who had been so fruitlessly smuggled into her palace had been legitimated the only thorn now left in her bed of roses was the enmity of the grand duke's brother the cardinal and her greatest ambition was to win him to her side in the autumn of seventeen eighty seven he was invited to florence and as the culmination of a series of festivities a grand banquet was given at which he had the place of honor at her right hand the feast was drawing near to its end bianca with sparkling eyes and flushed face looking lovelier than she had ever looked before was at her happiest for the cardinal had at last succumbed to her bright eyes and honeyed words it was the crowning moment of her many triumphs when life left nothing more to desire then it was at the supreme moment that tragedy in its most terrible form fell on the scene of festivity and mirth while bianca was smiling her sweetest on the cardinal she was seized by violent pains her mouth foams her face is distorted by agony she shrieks aloud that she is dying francesco tries to get to her aid but his steps are suddenly arrested he too is seized by the same terrible anguish a few hours later both she and he breathe their last breath poison was the word which ran through the palace and soon through florence from blanched lips to blanched lips some said it was the cardinal who had done the deed others whispered stories of a poison tart designed by bianca for the cardinal who refused to be tempted whereupon the grand duke had eaten of it and bianca seeing that her plot had so tragically miscarried seized the tart from her husband's hand and ate what was left of it the truth will never be known what we do know is that within a few hours of the last joke and the last drained glass of that fatal banquet the bodies of francesco and bianca were lying in death side by side in an adjacent room the door of which was locked against the eyes of the curious even against the physicians in the solemn lying in state that followed bianca had no place francesco alone by his brother's orders wore his crown in death as for bianca her body was hurried away and flung into the common vault of san lorenzo with the light of two yellow wax torches to bear it company and the jibes and jeers of florence for its only requiem end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of love affairs of the courts of europe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by simona rusu love affairs of the courts of europe by thornton hall chapter seventeen richelieu de rouet in the drama of the french court many a fine feathered villain struts his brief hour on the stage dazzling eyes by his splendour and shocking a world none too easily shocked in those days of easy morals by his profligacy but it would be difficult among all these gilded rakes to find a match for the duc de richelieu who carried his villainies through little less than a century of life born in sixteen ninety six when louis the fourteenth had still nearly twenty years of his long reign before him louis francois armand du plessis duc de richelieu survived to hear the rumblings which heralded the french revolution ninety-two years later and for three quarters of a century to be known as the most accomplished and heartless way in all france bearer of a great name and inheritor of the splendours and riches of his great uncle the cardinal who was louis the twelfth's right hand man and in his day the most powerful subject in europe the duke was born with a football of fortune at his feet and probably no man who has ever lived so shamefully prostituted such magnificent opportunities and gifts as a boy still in his teens he had begun to play the role of don juan at the court of the child king louis the fifteenth the most beautiful women of the court we are told went crazy over the handsome boy who bore the most splendid name in france and thus early his head was turned by flatteries and attentions which followed him almost to the grave 
the young duchesse de bourgogne the king's mother made love to him to the scandal of the court and from princesses of the blood royal to the humblest serving maid there was scarcely a woman at court who would not have given her eyes for a smile from the duc de fronsac as he was then known how he revelled in his conquests he makes abundantly clear in the memoirs he left behind him surely the most scandalous ever written in which he recounts his love affairs in long sequence with a cold-blooded heartlessness which shocks the reader to-day so long after lover and victims have been dust he revels in describing the artifices by which he got the most unsaleable of women into his power such as the young and beautiful madame michelin whose religious scruples proved such a frail barrier against the assaults of the young lothario he chuckles with a diabolical pride as he tells us how he played off one mistress against another how he made one liaison pave the way to its successor and how he abandoned each in turn when it had served its purpose and betrayed one after another the women who had trusted to his nebulous sense of honour a profligate so tempted as the duc de richelieu was from his earliest years one can understand however much we may condemn but for the man who conducted his love affairs with such heartlessness and dishonour no language has words of execration and contempt to describe him from his earliest youth there was no game too high for our don juan to fly at long before he had reached manhood he counted his lady loves by the score and among them were at least three royal princesses mademoiselle de charolais and two of the regent's own daughters the duchesse de berry and mademoiselle de valois later duchess of modena who in their jealousy were ready to tear each other's eyes out for love of the duke quarrels between the rival ladies were of everyday occurrence and even duels were by no means unknown when for instance the duke wearied of the lovely madame de polignac this lady was so inflamed by hatred of her successor in his affections the marquise de nesle that she challenged her to a duel to the death in the bois de boulogne when madame de polignac after a fierce exchange of shots saw her rival stretched at her feet she turned furiously on the wounded woman go she shrieked i will teach you to walk in the footsteps of a woman like me if i had a traitor here i would blow his brains out whereupon madame de nesle fainting as she was from loss of blood retorted that her love was worthy that even more noble blood than hers should be shed for him he is she said to the few onlookers who had hurried to the scene on hearing the shots the most amiable seigneur of the court i am ready to shed for him the last drop of blood in my veins all these ladies try to catch him but i hope that the proofs i have given of my devotion will win him for myself without sharing with any one why should i hide his name he is the duc de richelieu yes the duc de richelieu the eldest son of venus and mars such was the devotion which this heartless profligate won from some of the most beautiful and highly placed ladies of france what was the secret of the spell he cast over them it is difficult to say it is true that he was a handsome man as his portraits show but there were men quite as handsome at the french court he was courtly and accomplished but he had many rivals as clever and as skilled in the courtly arts as himself his power must one thinks have lain in that strange magnetism which women seemed so powerless to resist in men and which outweighs all graces of mind and physical perfections the duke's career however was not one unbroken dallying with love thrice at least he was sent to cool his ardour within the walls of the bastille on one occasion as the result of a duel with the comte de gassé his lady loves were desolate at the cruel fate which had overtaken their idol they fell on their knees at the regent's feet and with tears streaming down their pretty cheeks pleaded for his freedom two of the royal princesses both disguised as sisters of charity visited the prisoner daily in his dungeon carrying with them delicacies to tempt his appetite and consolation to cheer his captivity in vain did duke and comte both declare that they had never fought a duel and when in the absence of proof the regent insisted that their bodies should be examined for the convicting wounds the impish richelieu came triumphantly through the ordeal as the result of having his wounds covered with pink taffeta and skilfully painted 
it was a more serious matter than sent him again to the bastille in seventeen eighteen false to his country as to the victims of his fascinations he had been plotting with spain france's bitterest enemy for the seizure of the regent and the carrying him off across the pyrenees and certain incriminating letters sent to him by cardinal alberoni had been intercepted and were in the regent's hands the regent's daughter mademoiselle de valois warned her lover of his danger but too late before he could escape he was arrested and with an escort of archers was safely lodged in the bastille our lothario was now indeed in a parlous plight lodged in the deepest and most loathsome dungeon of the bastille a dungeon so damp that within a few hours his clothes were saturated without even a chair to sit on or a bed to lie on with legions of hungry rats for company he was now face to face with almost certain death the regent whose love affairs he had thwarted a score of times and who thus had no reason to love the profligate duke vowed that his head should pay the price of his treason once more the court ladies were reduced to hysterics and despair and forgot their jealousies in a common appeal to the regent for clemency mademoiselle de valois was driven to distraction and when tears and pleadings failed to soften her father's heart she declared in the hearing of the court that she would commit suicide unless her lover was restored to liberty in company with her rival mademoiselle de charolais she visited the dungeon in the dark night hours taking flint and steel candles and bonbons to weep with the captive she squandered two hundred thousand livres in attempts to bribe his guards but all to no purpose and it was not until after six months of durance that the regent at last yielded moved partly by his daughter's tears and threats and partly by the pleadings of the cardinal archbishop of paris and the prisoner was released on condition that the cardinal and the duchesse de richelieu would be responsible for his custody and good behaviour a few days later we find the irresponsible richelieu climbing over the garden walls of his new prison at conflans racing through the darkness to paris behind swift horses and making love to the regent's own mistresses and his daughter but such facilities for dalliance with the regent's daughter were soon to be brought to an end mademoiselle de valois in order to ensure her lover's freedom had at last consented to accept the hand of the duke of modena an allegiance which she had long fought against and before the duke had been a free man again many weeks she paid this part of his ransom by going into exile and to an odious wedding life in a far corner of italy much it may be imagined to the regent's relief for his daughters and their love affairs were ever a thorn in his side it was not long however before the new duchess of modena began to sigh for her distant lover and to bombard him with letters begging him to come to her i cannot live without your love she wrote come to me only come in disguise so that no one can recognize you this was indeed an adventure after the lotario's duke heart an adventure with love as its reward and danger as its spur and thus it was that a few weeks after the duchess had sent her invitation two travel-stained peddlers with packs on their backs entered the city of modena to find customers for their books and pamphlets at the small hostelry whose hospitality they sought the hawkers gave their names as gasparini and romano names which masked their identities of the knight-errant duke and his friend la fosse respectively the following morning behold the itinerant hawkers in the palace grounds their wares spread out to tempt the court ladies on their way to mass when the duchess herself passed their way and deigned to stop to converse graciously with the strangers to her inquiries they answered that they came from piedmont and their curious jargon on french and italian lent support to the story after inspecting their wares she asked for a certain book alas madame gasparini answered i have not a copy here but i have one at my inn and bidding him bring the volume to her at the palace the great lady resumed her devout journey to mass a few hours later gasparini presented himself at the palace with the required volume and was ushered into the august presence of the duchess a moment later on the closing of the door the royal lady was in the hawker's arms her own flung around his neck and with tears of joy she welcomed the lover who had come to her in such strange guise and at such risk 
a few stolen moments of happiness was all the lovers dared now to allow themselves the duke of modena was in the palace and the situation was full of danger but on the morrow he was going away on a hunting expedition and then well then they might meet without fear on the following day the coast now clear behold our hawker once more at the palace door with a bundle of books under his arm for the inspection of her highness and being ushered into the duchess's reading-room full of souvenirs of the happy days they had spent together in distant paris and versailles among them most prized of all was a lock of his own hair enshrined on a small altar and surmounted by a crown of interlocked hearts this lock the duchess told him she had kissed and wept over every day since they had parted each day now brought its hours of blissful meeting so seemingly short that the princess would throw her arms around her hawker's neck and implore him to stay a little longer one day however he tarried too long the duke returned unexpectedly from his hunting and before the lovers could part he had entered the room just in time to see the peddler bowing humbly in farewell to his duchess and to hear him assure her that he would call again with the further books she wished to see certainly it was a strange spectacle to greet the eyes of a home-coming duke that of his lady closeted with a shabby peddler of books but at least there was nothing suspicious in it and getting into conversation with the hawker the duke found him quite an entertaining fellow full of news of what was going on in the world outside his small duchy in his curious jargon of french and italian gasparini had much to tell his highness apart from book talk he entertained him with the latest scandals of the french court with gossip about well-known personages from the regent to dubois and what about the rascal the duc de richelieu asked the great man what tricks has he been up to lately oh answered gasparini with a wink at the duchess who was crimson with suppressed laughter he is one of my best customers ah monsieur le duc he is a gay dog i hear that all the women at the court are madly in love with him that the princesses adore him and that he is driving all the husbands to distraction is it as bad as that asked the duke with a laugh he is a more dangerous fellow even than i thought and what is his latest game oh answered the hawker i am told that he has made a wagger that he will come to modena in spite of you and i shouldn't be at all surprised if he does as for that said the duke with a chuckle i am not afraid i defy him to his worst and i am willing to wagger that i shall be a match for him however he added you are an entertaining fellow so come and see me again whenever you please and thus by the wish of the duchess's husband himself the ducal hawker became a daily visitor at the palace entertaining his highness with his chatter and when his back was turned making love to his wife and joining her in shrieks of laughter at his easy gullibility thus many happy weeks passed gasparini the peddler selling few volumes but reaping a rich harvest of stolen pleasure and revelling in an adventure which added such a new zest to to a life seated with more humdrum love-making but even the duchess's charms began to pall the ladies he had left so disconsolate in paris were inundating him with letters begging him to return to them letters all forwarded to him from his chateau at richelieu where he was supposed to be in retreat the lure was too strong for him and taking leave of the duchess in floods of tears he returned to his beloved paris to fresh conquests and thus it was with the gay duke until the century that followed that of his birth was drawing to its close until its sun was beginning to set in the blood of that revolution which if he had lived but one year longer would surely have claimed him as one of its first victims three wives he led to the altar the last one he had passed into the eighties but no marital duty was allowed to interfere with the amours which filled his life and to the last no pity ever gave a pang to the conscience which allowed him to pick and fling away his flowers at will and to trample one after another on the hearts that yielded to his love and trusted to his honour end of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of love affairs of the courts of europe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lisa Reichert. Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe by Thornton Hall. Chapter 18. The Indiscretions of a Princess. 
it was an ill fate that brought caroline princess of brunswick wolfenbüttel to england to be the bride of george prince of wales one april day in the year seventeen ninety five although probably no woman has ever set forth on her bridal journey with a lighter or prouder heart for as she said am i not going to be the wife of the handsomest prince in the world if she had any momentary doubt of this a glance at the miniature she carried in her bosom reassured her for the pictured face that smiled at her was handsome as that of an apollo no wonder the princess's heart beat high with pride and pleasure during that last triumphal stage of her journey to her husband's arms for he was not only the handsomest man with the best shaped leg in europe he was by common consent the greatest gentleman any court could show picture him as he made his first appearance at a court ball his coat we are told was of pink silk with white cuffs his waistcoat of white silk embroidered with various coloured foil and adorned with a profusion of french paste and his hat was ornamented with two rows of steel beads five thousand in number with a button and a loop of the same metal and cocked in a new military style see young florizel as he makes his smiling and gracious progress through the avenues of courtiers note the winsomeness of his smiles the inimitable grace of his bows his pleasant and courtly words of recognition and say if ever royalty assumed a form more agreeable to the eye and captivating to the senses florizel was indeed the most splendid prince in the world and the most perfect gentleman he was also though his bride-to-be little knew it the most dissolute man in europe the greatest gambler and voluptuary a man who was as false to his friends as he was traitor to every woman who crossed his path a man whom no appeal of honour or mercy could check in his selfish pursuit of pleasure i look through all his life thackeray says and recognise but a bow and a grin i try and take him to pieces and find silk stockings padding stays a coat with frogs and a fur collar a star and a blue ribbon a pocket handkerchief prodigiously scented one of truefit's best nutty brown wigs reeking with oil a set of teeth and a huge black stock under waistcoats more under waistcoats and then nothing french ballet dancers french cooks horse jockeys buffoons procuresses tailors boxers fencing masters china jewel and gimcrack merchants these were his real companions such was the husband princess caroline came so light-heartedly with laughter on her lips from brunswick to wed little dreaming of the disillusion and tears that were to await her on the very threshold of the life to which she had looked forward with such high hopes we get the first glimpse of caroline some twelve years earlier when sir john stanley who was making the grand tour spent a few weeks at her father's court he speaks of her as a beautiful girl of fourteen and adds i did think and dream of her day and night at brunswick and for a year afterwards i saw her for hours three or four times a week but as a star out of my reach years later he met her again under sadly changed conditions one day only he writes when dining with her and her mother at blackheath she smiled at something which had pleased her and for an instant only i could have fancied she had been the caroline of fourteen years old the lovely pretty caroline the girl my eyes had so often rested on with light and powdered hair hanging in curls on her neck the lips from which only sweet words seemed as if they would flow with looks animated and always simply and modestly dressed lady charlotte campbell too gives us a glimpse of her in these early and happier years before sorrow had laid its defacing hand on her the princess was in her early youth a pretty girl lady charlotte says with fine light hair very delicately formed features and a fine complexion quick glancing penetrating eyes long cut and rather small in the head which gave them much expression and a remarkably delicately formed mouth 
it was in no happy home that the princess had been cradled one may day in seventeen sixty eight her father charles william duke of brunswick was an austere soldier too much absorbed in his military life and his mistress to give much thought to his daughters her mother the duchess augusta sister of our own george the third was weak and small-minded too much occupied in self-indulgence and scandal-talking to trouble about the training of her children princess caroline herself draws an unattractive picture of her home life in answer to lady charlotte campbell's question were you sorry to leave brunswick not at all was the answer i was sick tired of it though i was sorry to leave my father i loved my father dearly better than any other person but there were some unlucky things in our court which made my position difficult my father was most entirely attached to a lady for thirty years who was in fact his mistress she was the beautifulest creature and the cleverest but though my father continued to pay my mother all possible respect my poor mother could not suffer this attachment and the consequence was i did not know what to do between them when i was civil to one i was scolded by the other and was very tired of being a shuttlecock between them but in spite of these unfortunate home conditions caroline appears to have spent a fairly happy girlhood thanks to her exuberant spirits and such faults as she developed were largely due to the lack of parental care which left her training to servants thus she grew up with quite a shocking disregard of conventions running wild like a young filly and finding her pleasure and her companions in undesirable directions strange stories are told of her girlish love affairs which seem to have been indiscreet if nothing worse while her beauty drew to her many a high-placed wooer including the prince of orange and prince george of darmstadt to all of whom she seems to have turned a cold shoulder but the wilful princess was not to be left mistress of her own destiny one november day in seventeen ninety four lord malmesbury arrived at brunswick court to demand her hand for the prince of wales whom his burden of debts and the necessity of providing an heir to the throne of england were at last driving reluctantly to the altar and thus a new and dazzling future opened for her to her parents nothing could have been more welcome than this prospect of a crown for their daughter while to her it offered a release from a life that had become odious the princess caroline much embarrassed on my first being presented to her malmesbury enters in his diary pretty face not expressive of softness her figure not graceful fine eyes good hands tolerable teeth fair hair and light eyebrows good bust short with what the french call des épaules impertinentes vastly happy with her future expectations such were malmesbury's first impressions of the future queen of england whom it was his duty to prepare for her exalted station a duty which he seems to have taken very seriously even to the regulating of her toilet and her manners thus a few days after setting eyes on her his diary records she will call ladies whom she meets for the first time mon coeur ma chère ma petite i am obliged to rebuke and correct her he lectures her on her undignified habit of whispering and giggling and impresses on her the necessity of greater care in her attire on more constant and thorough ablution more frequent changes of linen the care of her teeth and so on all of which admonitions she seems to have taken in excellent part with demure promises of amendment until he is impelled to write princess caroline improves very much on a closer acquaintance cheerful and loves laughing if she can get rid of her gossiping habit she will do very well thus a few months passed at the brunswick court the ceremonial of betrothal took place in december princess caroline much affected but replies distinctly and well the marriage contract was signed and finally on twenty eighth march the princess embarked for england on her journey to the unseen husband whose good looks and splendour have filled her with such high expectations that she had not yet learnt discretion in spite of all malmesbury's homilies is proved by the fact that she spent the night on board in walking up and down the deck in the company of a handsome young naval officer 
conduct which naturally gave cause for observation and suspicion in the affianced bride of the future king of england it was well perhaps that she had snatched these few hours of innocent pleasure for her first meeting with her future husband was well calculated to scatter all her rosy dreams arrived at last at st james's palace i immediately notified the arrival to the king and prince of wales says malmesbury the last came immediately i accordingly introduced the princess caroline to him she very properly attempted to kneel to him he raised her gracefully enough and embraced her said barely one word turned round and retired to a distant part of the apartment and calling to me said harris i am not well pray get me a glass of brandy i said sir had you not better have a glass of water upon which he much out of humour said with an oath no i will go directly to the queen and away he went the princess left during this short moment alone was in a state of astonishment and on my joining her said mon dieu is the prince always like that i find him very fat and not at all as handsome as his portrait such was the princess's welcome to the arms of her handsome husband and to the court over which she hoped to reign as queen nor did she receive much warmer hospitality from the prince's family the queen who had designed a very different bride for her eldest son received her with scarcely disguised enmity while the king although as he afterwards proved kindly disposed towards her treated her at first with an amiable indifference and certainly her attitude seems to have been calculated to create an unfavourable impression on her new relatives and on the court generally at the banquet which followed her reception malmesbury says i was far from satisfied with the princess's behaviour it was flippant rattling affecting raillery and wit and throwing out coarse vulgar hints about lady blank who was present the prince was evidently disgusted and this unfortunate dinner fixed his dislike which when left to herself the princess had not the talent to remove but by still observing the same giddy manners and attempts at cleverness and coarse sarcasm increased it till it became positive hatred what as thackeray asks could be expected from a wedding which had such a beginning from such a bridegroom and such a bride malmesbury tells us how the prince reeled into the chapel royal to be married on the evening of wednesday the eighth of april and how he hiccupped out his vows of fidelity my brother john duke of bedford records was one of the two unmarried dukes who supported the prince at the ceremony and he had need of his support for my brother told me the prince was so drunk that he could scarcely support himself from falling he told my brother that he had drunk several glasses of brandy to enable him to go through the ceremony there is no doubt that it was a compulsory marriage with such an overture we are not surprised to learn that the royal bridegroom spent his wedding night in a state of stupor on the floor of his bedroom or that at dawn when he had slept off the effects of his debauch pages heard cries proceeding from the nuptial chamber and shortly afterwards saw the bridegroom rush out violently nor we may be sure was the prince's undisguised hatred of his bride in any way mitigated by the stories which lady jersey and others of her rivals poured into his willing ears stories of her attachment to a young german prince whom she was not allowed to marry of a mysterious illness followed by a few weeks retreat of that midnight promenade with the young naval officer of assignations with major tobingen the handsomest soldier in europe who so proudly wore the amethyst tie-pin she had presented to him these and many another story which reflected none too well on her reputation before he had set eyes on her but it needed no such whispered scandal to strengthen his hatred of a bride who personally repelled him and who had been forced on him at a time when his heart was fully engaged with his lawful wedded wife mrs fitzherbert when it was not straying to lady jersey to perdita 
or others of his legion of lights o love from the first day the ill-fated union was doomed one violent scene succeeded another until before she had been two months a wife the prince declared that he would no longer live with her he would only wait until her child was born then he would formally and finally leave her thus three months after the birth of princess charlotte the deed of separation was signed and caroline was at last free to escape from a court which she had grown to detest with good reason and from a husband whose brutalities and infidelities filled her with loathing she carried with her however this consolation that the great hearty people of england loved and pitied her god bless you we will bring your husband back to you was among the many cries that greeted her as she left the palace on her way to exile but to quote thackeray again they could not bring that husband back they could not cleanse that selfish heart was hers the only one he had wounded steeped in selfishness impotent for faithful attachment and manly enduring love had it not survived remorse was it not accustomed to desertion for a time the outcast princess with her infant daughter led a retired life amid the peace and beauty of blackheath where she lived as simply as any bourgeoise playing the lady bountiful to the poor among her neighbours her chief pleasure seems to have been to surround herself with cottage babies converting montague house into a positive nursery littered up with cradles swaddling boards feeding bottles and other things of the kind but even to this rustic retirement watchful eyes and slanderous tongues followed her and it was not long before stories were passing from mouth to mouth in the court of strange doings at blackheath the princess it was said had become very intimate with sir john douglas and his lady her near neighbours and more especially with sydney smith a good-looking naval captain who shared the douglas home a man moreover with whom she had had suspicious relations at her father's court many years earlier it was rumoured that captain smith was a frequent and too welcome guest at montague house at hours when discreet ladies are not in the habit of receiving their male friends nor was the handsome captain the only friend thus unconventionally entertained there was another good-looking naval officer a captain manby and also sir thomas lawrence the famous painter both of whom were admitted to a suspicious intimacy with the princess of wales these rumours sufficiently disquieting in themselves were followed by stories of the concealed birth of a child who had come mysteriously to swell the numbers of the princess's protégés of the creche even king george whose sympathy with his heir's ill-used wife was a matter of common knowledge could not overlook a charge so grave as this it must be investigated in the interests of the state as well as of his family's honour and by his orders a commission of peers was appointed to examine into the matter and ascertain the truth the inquiry the delicate investigation as it was appropriately called opened in june eighteen o six and witness after witness from the douglases to robert bidgood a groom gave evidence which more or less supported the charges of infidelity and concealment the result of the investigation however was a verdict of acquittal the commissioners reporting that the princess although innocent had been guilty of very indiscreet conduct and this verdict the privy council confirmed for the princess it was a triumphant vindication which was hailed with acclamation throughout the country even the royal family showed their satisfaction by formal visits of congratulations to the princess from the king himself to the duke of cumberland who conducted his sister-in-law on a visit to the court but the days of blackheath and the amateur nursery were at an end the princess returned to london and found a more suitable home in kensington palace for some years where she held her court in rivalry of that of her husband at carlton house here she was subjected to every affront and slight by the prince and his set that the ingenuity of hatred could devise and to crown her humiliation and isolation her daughter charlotte was taken from her and forbidden even to recognize her when their carriages passed in the street or park 
can we wonder that under such remorseless persecutions the princess became more and more defiant that she gave herself up to a life of recklessness and extravagance that more and more isolated from her own world she sought her pleasure and her companions in undesirable quarters finding her chief intimates in a family of italian musicians or that finally heartbroken and despairing she determined once for all to shake off the dust of a land that had treated her so cruelly in august eighteen fourteen with the approval of king and parliament the princess left england to begin a career of amazing adventures and indiscretions the story of which is one of the most remarkable in history End of chapter eighteen Chapter Nineteen of Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Lisa Reichert. Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe by Thornton Hall. Chapter Nineteen The Indiscretions of a Princess Continued when caroline princess of wales shook the dust of england off her feet one august day in the year eighteen fourteen it was only natural that her steps should first turn her towards the brunswick home which held for her at least a few happy memories and where she hoped to find in sympathy and old associations some salve for her wounded heart but the fever of restlessness was in her blood the restlessness which was to make her a wanderer over the face of the earth for half a dozen years the peace and solace she had looked for in brunswick eluded her and before many days had passed she was on her way through switzerland to the sunny skies of italy where she could perhaps find in distraction and pleasure the anodyne which a life of retirement denied her she was full of rebellion against fate of hatred against her husband and his country which had treated her with such unmerited cruelty she would defy fate she would put a whole continent between herself and the nightmare life she had left behind she hoped for ever she would pursue and find pleasure at whatever cost in september within five weeks of leaving england we find her at geneva installed in a suite of rooms next to those occupied by marie louise late empress of france a fugitive and exile like herself and animated by the same spirit of reckless revolt against destiny marie louise we read quote, making excursions like a lunatic on foot and on horseback never even seeming to dream of making people remember that before she became mixed up with a corsican adventurer she was an archduchess End quote. The Princess of Wales, equally careless of her dignity and position, finding her pleasure in questionable company. Quote, From the inn where she was stopping, she heard music, and, quite unaccompanied, immediately entered a neighbouring house, and disappeared in the medley of dancers. End quote. A few days later, at Lausanne, quote, She learned that a little ball was in progress at a house opposite the Golden Lion, and she asked for an invitation after dancing with everybody and anybody she finished up by dancing a savoyard dance called a fricassee with a nobody madame de corsal who blushed and wept for the rest of the company declares that it has made her ill and that she feels that the honour of england has been compromised End quote. thus early did caroline begin that career of indiscretion to call it by no worse name which made of her six years' exile, quote, a long suicide of her reputation, end quote. In October we find the princess entering Milan, with her retinue of ladies-in-waiting, chamberlains, equerry, page, courier, and coachman, and with William Austin for companion, a boy now about thirteen whom she treated as her son, and who was believed by many to be the child of her imprudence at Blackheath, although the commission of the delicate investigation had pronounced that he was the son of a poor woman at Deptford. At Milan, as indeed wherever she wandered in Italy, the vagabond princess was received as a queen. Count de Bellegarde, the Austrian governor, was the first to pay homage to her. 
at the scala theatre the same evening her entry was greeted with thunders of applause and whenever she appeared in the milan streets it was to an accompaniment of doffed hats and cheers one of her first visits was to the studio of giuseppe bossi the famous and handsome artist whom she requested to paint her portrait on a thursday bossi records i sketched her successfully in the character of a muse then on a friday she came to show me her arms of which she was not without reason decidedly vain she is a gay and whimsical woman she seems to have a good art at times she is ennuyée through lack of occupation on one occasion when she met in the studio some french ladies two of whom had been mistresses of the king of westphalia the poor artist was driven to distraction by the chatter the singing and dancing in which the princess especially displayed her agility until as he pathetically says the house seemed possessed of the devil and you can imagine with what kind of ease it was possible for me to work before leaving milan the princess gave a grand banquet to bellegarde and a number of the principal men of the city a feast which was to have very important and serious consequences for it was at this banquet that general pino one of her guests introduced to caroline a new courier a man who though she little dreamt it at the time was destined to play a very baleful part in her life this new courier was a tall and strikingly handsome man who had seen service in the italian army until a duel in which he killed a superior officer compelled him to leave it in disgrace at the time he entered the princess's service he was a needy adventurer whose scheming brain and utter lack of principle were in the market for the highest bidder he is said baron Omteda, a sort of apollo of a superb and commanding appearance more than six feet high his physical beauty attracts all eyes this man is called pergami he belongs to milan and has entered the princess's service the princess he significantly adds is shunned by all the english people of rank her behaviour has created the most marked scandal such was the man with whose life that of the princess of wales was to be so intimately and disastrously linked and whose relations with her were to be displayed to a shocked world but a few years later it was indeed an evil fate that brought this superb apollo of the crafty brain and the consciousless ambition into the life of the princess at the high tide of her revolt against the world and its conventions when caroline and her retinue set out from milan for tuscany it was in the wake of pergami who had ridden ahead to discharge his duties as avant courier but before rome was reached his intimacy and familiarity with his mistress were already the subject of whispered comments and shrugged shoulders at a ball given in her honour at rome by the banker tortonia the princess shocked even the least prudish by the abandon of her dancing and the tenuity of her costume which we are told consisted of quote, a single embroidered garment fastened beneath the bosom without the shadow of a corset and without sleeves end quote. and at naples where king joaquim murat gave her a regal reception with a sequel of fetes and gala performances in honour of the wife of the regent of england she attended a rout at the teatro san carlo so lightly attired quote, that many who saw her at her first entrance looked her up and down and not recognizing her or pretending not to recognize her began to mutter disapprobation to such an extent that she was compelled to withdraw the english residents soon let her understand by ceasing to frequent her palace that even at naples there were certain laws of dress which could not be trampled under foot in this hoydenish manner while caroline was thus defying convention and even decency watchful eyes were following her everywhere a body of secret police whose headquarters were at milan was noting every indiscretion 
and every week brought fresh and damaging reports to england where they were eagerly welcomed by the regent and his satellites and while the princess was thus playing unconsciously or recklessly into the hands of the enemy pergami was daily making his footing in her favour more secure before caroline left naples he had been promoted from courier to equerry and in this more exalted and privileged role was always at her side so marked in fact was the intimacy even at this early stage that the princess's retinue one after another and on one flimsy pretext or another deserted her in disgust each vacancy as it occurred being filled by one of pergami's relatives his brother his daughter his sister-in-law the countess oidi and others until caroline was soon surrounded by members of the ex courier's family from naples she wandered to genoa and from genoa to milan and venice received regally everywhere by the italians and shunned by the english residents from venice she drifted to lake como with whose beauty she was so charmed that she decided to make her home there purchasing the via del garovo for one hundred and fifty thousand francs and setting the builders to work to make it a still more splendid home for a future queen of england but even to the lonely isolation of the italian lakes the eyes of her husband's secret agents pursued her spying on her every movement Quote, uncertain shadows gliding in the twilight along the paths and between the hedges and even in the cellars and attics of the villa End quote until the shadowy presences filled her with such terror and unrest that she sought to escape them by a long tour in the east thus it was that in november eighteen fifteen the princess and her pergami household set forth on their journey to sicily to nice athens the cities of the east and jerusalem the strange story of which was to be unfolded to the world five years later how intimate the princess and her handsome stalwart courier had by this time become was illustrated by the attorney-general in his opening speech at her memorable trial Quote, one day after dinner when the princess's servants had withdrawn a waiter at the hotel grand bretagne saw the princess put a golden necklace round pergami's neck pergami took it off again and put it jestingly on the neck of the princess who in her turn once more removed it and put it again round pergami's neck End quote. as early as august in this year pergami had his appointed place at the princess's table and his room communicating with hers and on the various voyages of the eastern tour there was abundant evidence to prove quote, the habit which the princess had of sleeping under one and the same awning with pergami end quote. but it is impossible in the limits of space to follow caroline and her famous cavalier through every stage of these eastern wanderings as it is unnecessary to describe in detail the evidence of intimacy so lavishly provided by the witnesses for the prosecution at the trial evidence much of which was doubtless as false as it was venal that the princess however was infatuated by her cavalier and that she was in the highest degree indiscreet in her relations with him seems abundantly clear whatever the precise degree of actual guilt may have been pergami had now been promoted from equerry to grand chamberlain to her royal highness and as further evidence of her favour she bought for him in sicily an estate which conferred on its owner the title of baron della francina at malta she procured for him a knighthood of that island's famous order at jerusalem she secured his nomination as knight of the holy sepulchre and to crown her favours she herself instituted the order of saint caroline with pergami for grand master behold now our ex-courier and adventurer in all his new glory as grand chamberlain and lover of a future queen of england as baron della francina knight of two orders and grand master of a third while every post of profit in that vagrant court was held by some member of his family the eastern tour ended which had ranged from algiers and egypt to constantinople and jerusalem and throughout which she had progressed and been received as a queen 
Caroline settled down for a time in her now restored villa on Lake Como, celebrating her return by lavish charities to her poor neighbours, and by popular fetes and balls, in one of which, quote, she danced as Columbine, wearing her lover's earrings, whilst Pergami, dressed as Harlequin, and wearing her earrings, supported her, end quote but even here she was to find no peace from her husband's spies, whose evidence, confirmed on oath by a score of witnesses, was being accumulated in London against the longed-for day of reckoning, and it was not long before Caroline and her grand chamberlain were on their wanderings again, this time to the Tyrol, to Austria, and through northern Italy, always inseparable and everywhere setting the tongue of scandal wagging by their indiscreet intimacy even the tragic death in childbirth of her only daughter the princess charlotte which put all england in mourning seemed powerless to check her career of folly it is true that on hearing of it she fell into a faint and afterwards into a kind of protracted lethargy but within a few weeks she had flung herself again into her life of pleasure chasing and reckless disregard of convention but matters were now hurrying fast to their tragic climax. For some time the life of George the Third had been flickering to its close. Any day might bring news that the end had come, and that the princess was a queen. And for some time Caroline had been bracing herself to face this crisis in her life, and to pit herself against her enemies in a grim struggle for a crown, the title to which her years of folly, for such at the best they had been, had so gravely endangered. Over the remainder of her vagrant life, with its restless flittings and its indiscretions marked by spying eyes, we must pass to that February morning in 1820 when, to quote a historian, the princess had scarcely reached her hotel at Florence when her faithful major-domo, John Jacob Sicard, appeared before her accompanied by two noblemen, and in a voice full of emotion announced, You are queen! the fateful hour had at last arrived when caroline must either renounce her new queendom or present a bold front to her enemies and claim the crown that was hers after a few indecisive days spent in rome where news reached her that the king had given orders that her name should be excluded from the prayer-book her wavering resolution took a definite and determined shape she would go to london and face the storm which she knew her coming would bring on her head at paris she was met by lord hutchinson with a promise of an increase of her yearly allowance to fifty thousand pounds on condition that she renounced her claim to the title of queen and consented never to put foot again in england an offer to which she gave a prompt and scornful refusal and on the afternoon of fifth june she reached dover greeted by enthusiastic cheers and shouts of god save queen caroline by the fluttering of flags and the jubilant clanging of church bells the wanderer had come back to the land of her sorrow to find herself welcomed with open arms by the subjects of the king whose brutality had driven her to exile and to shame the story of the trial which so soon followed her arrival has too enduring a place in our history to call for a detailed description the trial in which all the weight of the crown and the testimony of a small army of suborned witnesses a troop of comedians in the pay of malevolence to quote brougham were arrayed against her and in which she had so doughty a champion in brougham and such solace and support in the sympathy of all england we know the fate of that bill of pains and penalties which charged her with having permitted a shameful intimacy with one bartolomeo pergami and provided as penalty that she should be deprived of the title and privilege of queen and that her marriage to king george the fourth should be for ever dissolved and annulled and how it was forced through the house of lords with a diminishing majority and finally withdrawn and we know too the outburst of almost delirious delight that swept from end to end of england at the virtual acquittal of the persecuted caroline the generous exultation of the people was to quote a contemporary beyond all description it was a conflagration of hearts 
we also recall that pathetic scene when caroline presented herself at the door of westminster abbey to demand admission on the day of her husband's coronation to be received by the frigid words we have no instructions to allow you to pass and we can see her as humiliated confounded and with tears in her eyes she returned sadly to her carriage the heart crushed within her less than three weeks later seized by a grave and mysterious illness she laid down for ever the burden of her sorrows leaving instructions that her tomb should bear the words caroline the injured queen of england as for pergami the idol with the feet of clay who had clouded her last years in tragedy he survived for twenty years more to enjoy his honours and his ill-gotten gold while william austin who had masqueraded as a prince and called caroline mother ended his days while still a young man in a madhouse End of chapter 19